اللهم صل على محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأجساد وشفائها ونور الأبصار وجلائها وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Brothers and sisters here, at the International Islamic University in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. But now because of modern technology, I also have to offer salams to all those around the world who are going to be viewing the lecture. To something called live streaming across there. Even my own daughter, Hira, in Karachi, Pakistan, listening to her father as I speak. So, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah to all of you in France, in Britain, in the United States, in Canada, in Indonesia, in South Africa, and wherever you may be listening or viewing this lecture on the subject. The Quranic foundation and structure of Muslim society, based on the book by the same topic, written by my teacher of blessed memory, Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah, it's in a two volumes. It took us five years to reformat and reprint this book in this new beautiful design with a lovely case. And tonight we launch this new reprint. I spoke last in this masjid perhaps about three months ago when I was privileged to take up that exciting topic that will not die, the conquest of Constantinople in Akhiru Zaman. And Alhamdulillah it has provoked a lot of comment around the world and in particular in Turkey where more and more Turkish Muslims are returning to the subject to re-examine the validity of the traditionally held view that the prophecy concerning the conquest of Constantinople was fulfilled some 600 years ago. To now examine the new thesis expounded right here from this masjid that the conquest of Constantinople 
prophesied by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam, that conquest is still to come. That it occurs in Akhiru Zaman and it will occur after the Malham. And now tonight, again we take up a very important subject concerning the status and the role and the place of the Qur'an in our individual lives as Muslims and in our collective life, our Muslim society. Is the Qur'an at the foundation of our thought? Is the Qur'an at the foundation of Muslim life today? in the world of Islam. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam prophesied about akhir zaman in a hadith narrated by Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu in the Sunan of Tirmidhi yushikwa ya'ti ala nasi zaman it will not be long before that time will come upon mankind. لا يبقى من الإسلام لسم when nothing will remain of Islam but the name when nothing will remain of Islam but the name ولا يبقى من القرآن إلا رسم and when nothing will remain of the Quran except the traces of the writing mechanically recited مساء مساجدهم آمرة وهي خراب من الهدى At that time the masajid would be grand structures multi-million dollar buildings iron and steel but devoid of guidance and so a masjid is not a place where you go only to find peace and to perform your salat peacefully and to go back home and read nasi biryani and go to sleep. A masjid is a place which must educate and guide because he said that masadiluhum amiratun wa hiya kharabu min al huda that the masajid will be grand structures but devoid of guidance. And then the last part of the hadith that is seldom ever quoted today. You might hear the first part, but you wouldn't hear the last part. Ulama'uhum sharrun nasi mimman tahta adim sama. من عندهم تخرج الفتنة وفيهم تعود. These are not the words of Imran. These are the words of our leader, our Nabi Muhammad عليه الصلاة والسلام. That the ulama, the religious scholars of Islam, at that time, of that page, of those people. Would be the worst people beneath the sky. From them will come that which will corrupt. They will be the centers of corruption. He also said that when Islam commenced, it was something gharib, strange different from the conventional wisdom, Con different from what was universally accepted and practiced. Something gharib, strange and different. And that Islam will return to what it was when it started. So give glad tidings for those who live. That strange life 
different from the rest. And so it's not the majority, not the big crowds who can claim validity for their version of the truth. It's the exception to the rule. The one that looks so strange, that's where you'll find Islam. And so we return to the question, here is the work in which he shows what are the foundations in the Quran of Muslim society. Are we a people who are following the Quran? Many of those who are my critics, sometimes not so very respectful critics, <laughs> claim to be a people of the Quran and the Sunnah. We are the people of the Quran and the Sunnah. And you are the people of Bid'ah. You are the people of Shirk. And because my teacher of blessed memory was a Sufi Sheikh, they take out every single weapon in the armory for me. And so we ask today, those who say that we are the people of the Quran and Sunnah, can I take a look at your wallet, if you have one? Do you mind my looking and see what kind of money are you using? Huh? Is this the Quran? And is this the Sunnah? You've got to use this every time you buy and sell. You've got to use this to store the value of your wealth. You have to use this when you have to measure the value of things. Because this is what you have accepted as money. But when I use the Quran and I use the Sunnah, having studied international monetary economics, at two universities, I have come to the conclusion that this is bogus, that this is fraudulent, that this is haram, and that this has been brought into being by our most dangerous enemies and has been used they're not going to be using it for much longer again because they don't need it anymore. They have something better coming to replace it. And has been used to function as a vehicle of the economic and financial impoverishment, exploitation and enslavement of the masses around the world. This is not Quran. This is not Sunnah. I want to say to you tonight, my critics, this is Bid'ah. But you have eyes, you cannot see. We just concluded yesterday an international conference on Riba here in Kuala Lumpur. And I was so happy to find scholars who had come from abroad, who are not Muslims, and who spoke with such great integrity and proclaimed the truth about the monetary system. And they who came from abroad, like Hugo Salinas Price from Mexico, when they heard Dr. Muhammad Mahathir speak, 
on Monday morning to address that conference on money. They were amazed that this man is a secular, secular nationalist politician. He never went to Al Azhar University. He's not a sheikh. And yet he is more accurate. And he spoke, he spoke with greater truth about the monetary system today. The former leader of Malaysia. And yet all of us, including Imran Hussein, we are all using this paper. And we cannot get out of it. If we had the Quran and the Sunnah, we would know what is money in Islam. And we would not be asleep concerning the bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram money that we are using now. And we would not be asleep when the enemy brings the electronic money or digital money, which is now replacing it. But this is not the subject of my lecture tonight. How riba has been used to enslave us. If we had the Quran, at the foundation of our educational system, our university study, if we had the Quran at the foundation, we would have understood that the political system which has now embraced us around the world, the modern Republican state, was designed and created by our most dangerous enemies and has functioned as a vehicle to disempower us, to reduce us to a position that is powerless, where we have to submit to them. If we had the Qur'an at the foundation of our thought, we would not have given up the model of a state and of a political system given to us by the Anbiya alayhim salam, not only by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, no, he was the last, but there were others before him who gave us a model of a state and of a political system which is the opposite of what we have now been embraced with. And so you would not have Ikhwan al-Muslimun in Egypt fighting in elections to validate that electoral process of that state. <laughs> And then to beat the drums, we have been victorious, we now have power in Egypt. You have eyes, Ikhwan, and yet you do not see. What is it that explains this colossal failure? And I have only touched the monetary and the political. I have not touched the banking, I have not touched the educational system, the model of the modern university, Cairo University down the road, Al-Azhar down this road, and that one created as the rival of this one. What explains this colossal failure? My teacher was born in India, in the city of Meerat, in 1914. And uh, from a family that came from Saharanpur, 
and mashallah we have a hafiz somewhere in this gathering from Saharanpur somewhere. And uh, when Pakistan came into being, they had to migrate even to Karachi. But he studied not in Idarul Ulum. If he had done that, he could not have produced this book. Because as much as there was integrity in the Darul Ulum and the Jamia, they remained faith, faithful to a classical model of education. But they failed to examine the modern world, to understand it, to penetrate it, using the Quran, and then to respond to its unprecedented challenges in a manner which was appropriate. So if he had studied in Idarul Ulum, he would not have become the scholar that he became. Rather, he studied at the Aligarh Muslim University. And there at Aligarh, he was introduced to the best scholarship that Britain and Europe had because they brought them to Aligarh. And these scholars who came from Britain and from Europe had to go, uh, had to function alongside scholars of Islam. And in that setting, the young minds were able to develop the capacity to study modern civilization. And the thought which had come out of modern civilization, which may be called modern thought. But more importantly, he was not only a student of Aligarh Muslim University where he studied philosophy to the PhD level, but he was also the disciple of a Sufi Sheikh, Maulana. Muhammad Abdul Alim Siddiqui Rahimahullah. And from Maulana Muhammad Abdul Alim Siddiqui Rahimahullah, he was introduced to the spiritual quest in Islam. We have Al Islam, and then you go to Al Iman. And then you reach the summit, which is Al-Ihsan. And Al-Ihsan is an ta'abud Allah ka'annaka tara. That you should worship Allah, that you should serve Allah as though you are seeing Him. But can you see Him with His eyes? Arini, anzur ilayk. And came the response, lantarani. No, you can't see me with these arms. No. But Allah says, فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعَمَلْ It's not their eyes which are blind. وَلَكِنْ تَعَمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ What is blind is the heart which is inside the chest. And so not only do we see with the external eye, but we also see with an internal eye. And so Ihsan, Al-Ihsan is that you should worship Allah and serve Allah as though you are seeing Him with the eye of your heart. The capacity to see with the internal eye, that is the spiritual quest. And the path of knowledge, the struggle for knowledge, particularly in Akhirul Zaman, cannot succeed if you see with only external sign. Forget it! You can complete your PhD from UIA, 
and go back home and get a big job. <laughs> but you still will not be able to penetrate the reality of things. No. And so my teacher of blessed memory was blessed to have this spiritual teacher who gave to him the absolute importance, the imperative of the spiritual quest for the pursuit of knowledge. And so he was able to recognize that modern Western civilization did not emerge in history by accident, but rather as the supreme test, the greatest fitna that mankind would ever experience from the time of Adam alayhi salam to the last day. This is it. And the modern thought and knowledge that was coming from this civilization is the supreme intellectual test that mankind will ever face. And it was necessary to respond to it. Can't run away. And that's what he did in this book. Using the Quran to re-articulate Islam in a manner which responded to the challenges of the modern age. What came out of this book as lesson number one, which explains our failure, our colossal failure, is the recognition that the Quran is the supreme guide. It is the supreme authority and it is the only absolute authority in Islam. Allah himself protects the Quran. وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِذُونَ and the relationship of the ahadith with the Quran is of supreme importance because the ahadith explain the Quran. Amplify the Quran. The Quran is now at work living in society in the ahadith. But, he said, the Qur'an is the only absolute authority. Hence the relationship between the Qur'an and the Ahadith. Now listen carefully. Is that the Qur'an sits in judgment over the Hadith. If you go back home and forget everything else, don't forget these words. That the Quran sits in judgment over the hadith. Not vice versa. This is methodology step number one. And so if a fabricated hadith <laughs> has been inserted and all the scholars of a hadith in our history, have always affirmed the presence of fabricated hadiths, put there to serve different mischievous ends. If there is a conflict between what is in the Quran and what is in the hadith, regardless of whether it is sahih or not, if there is even the appearance of a conflict between the Qur'an, what is plainly stated in the Qur'an and in the Hadith, what do you do? The answer is stay with the Qur'an. 
for the Quran sits in judgment over the hadith. But he taught another lesson, which is even more important. He said, do not take any verse of the Quran in isolation. And we do not have the time tonight to elaborate on that methodology. Otherwise, we'll be here all night. If you take verses of the Quran in isolation by themselves, stand alone, you can make a mistake, an embarrassing mistake. That Iblis was an angel <laughs> because the command was given to the angels. That's the kind of mistake you can make. Iblis was an angel. And then afterwards, your face is covered red when Allah says in the Quran, What can I mean, Al Jin? Uh oh, too bad. I used the wrong methodology and I declared on CNN. It, Iblis is an angel and now I'm so embarrassed I'm wrong because Allah says Wakana mina jin. he said don't do that rather the proper methodology is given in Surah to Ali Imran at the very beginning that there are two kinds of verses in the Quran there are those which are muhkamat plain and clear and there are others which by divine wisdom have to be interpreted. Mutashabihat. They have to be subjected to ta'wil, ta'wil, ta'wil. Interpretation. These are not there in the Quran as window dressing. No. These verses are there in the Quran to play a specific role, a critically important role. And Allah says that the only ones who know the meaning of these verses of the Quran are Allah wa rasikhuna fil ilm. The rasikhuna fil ilm are the true scholars. Not, if you'll excuse the expression, fly by night. <laughs> the true scholars are those who are firmly rooted in knowledge. The motivational speaker has his role to play, to lift your spirits, like you had in the Heroes Conference. Uh, I had to withdraw from your hero's conference because my integrity is at stake. I want people to know that when Imran speaks, we can trust him that he is not the gramophone record of any Tom, Dick or Harry. That what has to be said, he will say it. I have worked hard, very hard I have worked, to earn this status. And so when conditions are imposed upon me, it doesn't matter if it's a university or who it may be, I decline. The only time I'll speak is when I have the freedom to speak and I use my own judgment to act responsibly. But no one will tell me Imran, you're not allowed to say this or you're not allowed to say that. So I was hoping. Motivational speakers have their role to play. But scholarship is something else. Scholarship is not motivational. Scholarship is scholarship. And the scholar of Islam has to go to the totality of the Quran. The whole Quran. And find all that there is in the Quran on the particular subject, like money for example. Like the political system, for example. Like the model of a state, for example. And bring all those verses together, all those ayat together. 
to form a harmonious integrated whole. Knowing that in the Quran there are no internal contradictions. Law kana min inda ghayrillahi la wajadu fi ikhtilafan kathira. La wajadu fi ikhtilafan kathira. Had this Quran come from any source other than from Allah, they would have found in it many internal contradictions. But there are no contradictions in the Quran. And so you have an intellectual jihad to bring all those verses of the Quran together to form a harmonious integrated whole. That's scholarship. Motivation of Islam is one thing, <laughs> but this is scholarship. And you cannot bring them all together, as every scientist would tell you. You do your homework. Every scientist has to do his homework. Long hours of research and study. But at the end of the day, when you have done your homework, you have fulfilled all the requirements. And all that you are searching for now is that which will bind it all together as a harmonious, integrated whole. He calls it the system of meaning of the subject. That system of meaning of the subject will not come to you as the ultimate fruit of a rational struggle. No. The rational work has to be done. The research work has to be done. But at the end of the day, Allah will bless you with spiritual insight. It is spiritual insight that makes you different from the think tanks of Washington. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, He said, Ittaku firasat al mu'min. Fear, fear the firasa, the wisdom that comes from internal, intuitive, spiritual insight. Basira. Fear the firasa of the mu'min. Fa innahu yanzuru bi nurillah. For when he sees, he sees with more than a PhD from you, I. When he sees, he sees with the nur of Allah. And it is with the nur of Allah, eventually, that the Quran will open to you. That's scholarship. That's motivational speech. This is scholarship. And it is because this methodology has not been used that the Quran has not, we, we failed the Quran. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu islam spoke with sorrow the words are from Allah. Surah Al Furqan. Waqal al Rasul. And the Messenger of Allah said, Ya Rabb, O oh my Lord God, Inna qawmi takhadu hadha al-Qur'ana mahjura. Surely my people have abandoned this Qur'an. We have abandoned the Qur'an because this is what we are using today as money. We have abandoned the Qur'an because we have abandoned the model of the Khilafah state, which recognize Allah as sovereign, Al Malik, which recognize Allah's authority as supreme, Al Akbar, which recognize Allah's law as the supreme law, Al Hakam. And today we are in the vicious embrace of 
the United Nations Organization. The Security Council of the United Nations says, stand up, you got to stand up. Because in the Charter, you are told you must obey. <laughs> and they must all obey. And when the Security Council says, sit down, you must sit down. So tell me, who is uh, sovereign? Is it Allah or the UN? What answer will we give in the grave? It is because we have failed the Quran that we are in the mess in which we are today. You will have to spend a lot of time reading this book, slowly. What he does is to turn to the Quran to reconstruct our economic life using every verse of the Quran that is applicable to our economic life. He does the same thing for our political life. This is the second volume. And it is in the second volume that he goes into the Quran to take out from the Quran all the relevant verses. Our economic life, our political life, our social life, our educational life our spiritual life, the relationship, the spiritual relationship that we have with Allah, the spiritual relationship that we have with Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam, inna allaha wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. The spiritual relationship that we have with him, ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, Sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. The spiritual relationship that we have with the malaika, the angels. And then he proceeds to in social relationships. What is our relationship with our neighbors? What are our duties to our neighbors? And what are the rights of our neighbors? What are the rights of women? What are the rights of wives? What are the duties of husbands to wives? What are the duties of parents to children? Hmm? We want to build a Muslim village. And mashallah, there's one project in Egypt, they've only bought land. There's one project in South Africa, Cape Town, they're about to buy the land. There's one project in Pakistan, in Multan. They're having difficulty to buy agricultural land because it's so expensive. <laughs> but here in Malaysia we have two projects. One in Pira, one in Kalantan. The one in Pira already, already has the land, the one in Kalantan already paid down on the land. The land is cheap. We have uh, news from Ivory Coast in Africa. My students have already bought the land. So in a number of countries, projects for building Muslim villages. But because of the Quran, we are able to say that every woman has the right to a husband. But every man does not have the right to a wife. Every man has a duty to marry a woman. <laughs> and so any woman who comes to the Muslim village, and for some of them when I speak it's like music in their ears. Any woman who comes to the Muslim village and says, I want a husband. I want a husband. Somebody in the village will have to offer to marry her. Not because you offer to marry her, she has to accept the offer. No. <laughs> she has the right to accept or not to accept. So don't believe because you offer, she's going to accept it. 
This is how we are different from the world today. In the Muslim village, because of our understanding of the Quran regarding business, regarding the market, regarding buying and selling, we will establish our micro market. And in our micro market, you will not be allowed to use bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper and plastic and electronic money. No. So no online purchases <laughs> because we are even outside the electronic range <laughs> of the wireless computers and so on. Rather in our Muslim village we use dinar and dirham. But I have recognized that although 20 years ago when a few of us were speaking on this subject and we were like voices crying in the wilderness 20 years ago when some of you were not even born. We were at work. About dinar and dirham. Nobody was listening. Today, 20 years later, the former Prime Minister of Malaysia is one of the most powerful voices criticizing the monetary system. And today, 20 years later, dinar and dirham are being minted in this country, even by non-Muslims. <laughs> Readily available. And so there is no excuse for us not using it in our market. If you abandon a sunnah, and I come and tell you you have abandoned a sunnah, what should you do? Go home and eat nasi biryani and go to sleep? Or make tawbah? This book has come to ask us to make tawbah and return to the Quran to restore the Quranic foundations and structure of our society. So we make toba and we return to dinar and dirham. And of course you know that when dinar and dirham are in short supply in the market, what would they use as money in Medina? Paper? No. They use dates as money. But who teaches that subject today? Who teaches that subject today? And if dates were not there, you'd use wheat, or you'd use barley, or you'd use salt. And by analogy, if you're in Indonesia, you'd use rice as money. And by analogy, if you're in Cuba, you'd use sugar as money. The non-Muslim scholars who came to our conference were amazed to hear that Islam stood for a free and a fair market. That there is no such thing as price control in the market in Islam. Even our governments don't know that today. Ignorance is so great. And so we return to dinar and dirham. But if I ask you, take whatever savings you have, buy dirhams with it. But when you go to the supermarket, you can't use the dirhams. Hmm? You want to buy a ticket to go back home, you can't use the dirhams. So what to do? Perhaps one of the temporary solutions would be that we establish a counter for non-profit, non-profit exchange. 
that if you buy the dirham from us at 19 Malaysian ringgits, in France it will be different, in the United States it will be different, in Pakistan it will be different, in Bangladesh it will be different, whatever be the price. If you buy it from us at 19 ringgits for one dirham, Anytime you want to come back and change it back to ringgits, we'll do it for you at the same 19. So that anyone who has dirhams, but need to buy something, but cannot use it, would be able to change it to the dirham, to the ringgits, and use it. And so people will be encouraged to buy more and more dirhams, one last point concerning the thought of Mawlana Fadl Rahman Ansari rahimahullah. And that is that Mawlana Fadl Rahman Ansari, my teacher of blessed memory, rejected sectarianism. in the India and Pakistan in which he grew up and lived, the sects were called by different names. So he used to stand up publicly and declare, I am not Devobandi, which is one of the sectarian movements. And I am not Burelvi, which is another sectarian movement. And I am not Ahli Hadith, which is another sectarian movement. <laughs> and I am not, well the term has been used for centuries now, Wahhabi, which is another sectarian movement. He rejected sectarian. And he said, I am a Muslim. Full stop. So the Deobandis rejected him, and the Brelvis rejected him, and those rejected him, and this rejected him, and we he was left almost alone. Because he refused to be identified with any sectarian movement. He recognized sectarianism to be a curse. And that the command of the Quran was وَعْتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Do not be disunited. Hold on to the rope of Allah. All of you together. And so he argued that the Quran was to be used to unite the people, not divide them. And that the person of the Prophet and his sunnah must be used to unite the Muslims and not divide them. <coughs> he coined a new term. He said, I stand for orthodoxy. Orthodoxy means Quran and sunnah. That's orthodoxy. But I stand for dynamic orthodoxy. And uh, our critics, particularly on the internet, have been putting question marks. What is this dynamic orthodoxy? We never heard about it. We know what is Salafi Islam. We know what is Sufi Islam. But what is this? dynamic orthodoxy. And tonight, before we end, we must explain. 
what he meant by dynamic orthodoxy was the capacity to go to the Quran primarily and then to the Sunnah and the Hadith in order to be able to use the Quran and Muhammad alayhi salatu wassalam to defend Islam in this age to understand the world today to penetrate its reality using the Quran and the Sunnah being faithful to the Quran and the Sunnah never stepping away from the Quran and the Sunnah and then to respond to its awesome challenges in a manner which was appropriate. That is dynamic orthodoxy. He began the book, volume one, the very first chapter of volume one recognizes that those who are waging war on Islam today in the world, in modern age, are a Jewish Christian group. He recognized it was not just Jews. He recognized it was not just Christians. He recognized that there was a Judeo-Christian coming together. A mysterious Judeo-Christian alliance. This is his insight. It took me years to recognize that. And it was that Judeo-Christian alliance that was vilifying Islam and waging monstrous war on Muslims and on the person of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu Now that is an amazing insight because it is the Quran which warned us about it. You may have heard me explaining the ayah so many times. Doesn't Imran have any other verse of the Quran to talk about it? We've heard it so many times, Imran. Well, listen to it one more time. <laughs> Remember, this is the opening chapter of the book. And Allah says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, but somehow this verse of the Quran seems to have gone in a place called cold storage. Either it is never quoted, or when it is quoted, it is misquoted, misunderstood. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu O you who have faith in Allah La tattakhidu al-yahuda wal-nasara awliya Do not take the Jews Do not take your, the, the Christians As your friends and allies Don't take Barak Obama Your friends and allies Is Allah speaking about all Jews and all Christians? If you use the lazy methodology, you know, taking a verse by itself, yeah, all Jews, all Christians. But you'll be wrong. You'll be embarrassed. Later on when you find in the Quran the evidence, you're wrong. No, Allah is not speaking about all Jews and all Christians because then the Quran will be contradicting itself. 
Well, then the question now arises, which Jews and which Christians is he speaking about? When he says, do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends or not. Proper methodology. And the answer is right there in the words which follow. Do not take such Jews and such Christians as your friends and allies who themselves are awliya to each other, who themselves are friends and allies of each other. The Quran is warning us of a time which is to come when a mysterious Jewish-Christian alliance is going to emerge. My brothers in Libya didn't study the Quran. If only they had studied the Quran. And my brothers in Syria did not study the Quran. If only they had studied the Quran. What else can I do? The Quran is anticipating the emergence of a Jewish Christian alliance. And the Quran is warning. And remember, this is a command of Allah in the Quran. This is a powerful statement. I mean, this part of the verse should shake all the walls of this building. Whosoever from amongst you turn to them for friendship for alliance, for weapons, for money, for no-fly zone. You belong to them, not to us anymore. Calling for a no-fly zone. The Jewish Christian Alliance is here today. It is the Zionist Jews and the Zionist Christians who have come together. We had Christians in our conference yesterday and day before. Yes, and they stood beside us like brothers and sisters, fighting a common cause. They were not Zionists, they were Christians. And there's a Jewish uh, a scholar and journalist in London who is constantly interviewing me. What's his name? Morris. Herman Morris. I hope you're listening to this. <laughs> and he's Jewish. So Allah is not speaking about all Jews and all Christians. Allah is speaking about a Jewish Christian alliance. And if you turn to them for friendship and alliance, you no longer belong to us, you belong to them. In Allah their trademark is full of wickedness. And Allah does not provide guidance to the wicked. So here is a pivotally important verse of the Quran, which did not escape the attention of Mawlana Fadl Rahman Ansari. That he began his book, first chapter, pointing to the campaign of vilification of that Jewish Christian alliance. And so we say tonight, and let us try to say it gently, that if you want to become a friend and ally of NATO, let me tell you if you do not know it, 
the NATO or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is the military arm of world Zionism. If you did not know it, your brother Imran is telling you. And if you want to continue to make alliance with NATO, and don't tell me that I am a supporter of Gaddafi, and I am defending Gaddafi, that's false. And don't tell me I am a supporter and defender of the Syrian government or any other government in the world of Islam. That's false. Stop wasting my time and yours. I'm not a supporter of any of these governments. I'm calling for the return of Khilafah. Didn't you know that? So if you want to take weapons and take money from the NATO Zionist organization or from the clients of the Zionists that Saudi Arabia and Qatar. And I thank Allah that I have the courage and the freedom to speak these words. If you want to be their friends and allies to overthrow Qadhafi and to overthrow Assad and whoever else they may be in your way. And I speak to you and I tell you Allah has prohibited you, prohibited you, prohibited you from doing that. And you still want to continue in that path. Then please stay away from me. Please stay away from me. Go your way. I don't want to see your face. I don't want to hear your voice. You are not my brothers. I speak gently, not harshly. I don't speak with anger, I speak with sadness because they have eyes and yet do not see. They have ears and yet do not hear. They have hearts and yet do not understand. Perhaps it's their sectarianism which has caused them to become cattle or worse than cattle. And so Mawlana Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah Use the Qur'an and use the Sunnah to unite, to unite them. Yes, he was Sufi. Yes, he was a Sufi Sheikh. And yes, this is his student. Whatever scholarship Allah has blessed me to deliver to the world of Islam, the credit goes to him in his grave. And I'm not his only student, I'm just the most visible. But there are others more learned than I am. Yes, he was a Sufi sheikh. Read this book. This is his major work as a Sufi sheikh. And tell me if you find anything in this book which is in conflict with the Quran and Sunnah. Come on, do it. The reason why you will not find it, because what he called Sufism or Tasawwuf, what he meant was al -Ihsa. There was no difference between the two. And al ihsan is not a sectarian movement. al ihsan is the high stage of Islam. Having explained this last part of the subject, I think I have in a nutshell, in a nutshell, in a brief period of time, I believe I have given you the substance of his thought and the foundations of this work. I urge you not just to study the book, but to take your time page by page. If you have to spend a whole year to read it, do it page by page. Keep the Quran at your side when you're studying this book. It might also be beneficial to buy a bottle of Tylenol tablets because the language is difficult. If you know the English language as I do, it is still difficult. Alhamdulillah, we have someone in France who is translating to French. 
We have someone in the United States who is ready to translate for Arabic and someone in Jinda who is going to be meeting me perhaps two days from now to try to organize the meeting the cost of translation of this book into Arabic. And with your dua, maybe we'll be able to get translations in Urdu, in Bengali. Bengali is a very important language. And with the local language of this country, Bahasa Malaysia. Uh, although this is not my book, Allah, 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 Allah,